Well, of course, it all began in 1927 when a number of people founded the society, which is usually called the German Rocket Society. Its real name was Verein für Raumschifffahrt, which means Society for Space Travel. I must say that our sights were set high from the very outset. Uh, this society was founded in 1927, as I mentioned, but did not start experimenting until 1929. And just as the door to actual experimentation was opened, a new man appeared on the scene, namely Werner von Braun. Uh, you remember how we met? Yes, Willie, I, I left school in uh, the spring of 1930, and uh, I had... Uh, read everything by then that had been published in the space field, including your own books. So it was only natural for me to try to get in contact with you and with the other people who had been active in this field before in order to make myself useful. And I remember well how I visited you in your home in Berlin and asked me to uh, accept me in the rocket team and uh, get me in contact in particular with Professor Obert, who yes. was all our mentor at that time. Of course, Obert had written the important theoretical book. I believe it was a rainy afternoon. I know it was afternoon, and I think it was a rainy afternoon. My memory has this dimly in its background. What I do remember clearly is uh, that I was not in at the moment you arrived, and you passed the time playing the piano, and I've told many audiences since that what you played was the first movement of the Moonlight Sonata. So I must have been moonstruck even then. But you were moonstruck even then. Now, I'm not mm. talking as a mu music critic. I don't know how well you played it, but that's <laughs> what you played. <laughs> yeah, I remember. And then, from then on, of course, I remember that my first activity in uh, practical rocketry was to assist Obert and the other members of the German Society of Space Travel to put an exhibit into one of the big department stores in Berlin. Yes. There was a uh, gyroscope in that exhibit and a mock-up of a rocket which Obert had proposed to build and several components. A little launching rack? Yes, a little launching rack. and Which looked very big then. It was mm. probably all of 15 feet tall yes. and Compared to a gentry of today, you wouldn't see it, but it looked large then. Um, one of the pieces that impressed me most was a very rudimentary little rocket motor that Obert had used in his early experiments in Neubabelsberg by the Ufa Film Company. You remember he... Yeah. Uh, the he, so-called uh, Kegeldüse. Yes, he, uh, Obert, uh, Obert services had been secured by Ufa, uh, help him as an advisor on their motion picture... Uh, the Girl in the Moon, remember? Yes. Uh, Frau im Mond? Fr yeah, Frau im Mond. Fritz Lang did this. I know a little more about this. It was started uh, late in 1928, in fall of 1928. Fritz Lang was then married to the novelist Thea von Harbou, who had written the book. And at first they had Max Vallier in mind as a scientific advisor because he was doing most of the newspaper writing and his name was known. For some reason, Fritz Lang decided that Max Valier was not, not the man for him, and he wanted somebody better. And so he wrote a long letter to Professor Obert, who then lived in Romania. And uh, at the last moment, Fritz Lang changed his mind in one respect. He had the letter sent as a telegram. It was several pages long. And then Obert came to Berlin. And uh, while the filming was going on, and Obert gave all this advice, uh, we started talking, by we I mean myself largely, uh, too long whether the uh, premiere of the movie could not be combined with an actual rocket shot. Wasn't it so, Willie, that uh, originally Fritz Lang Ober offered Obert a very substantial remuneration for his services, and Obert said, uh, well, I would rather uh, see you finance some rocket tests that I would like to make with that money, and when Lang saw these uh, big flames shooting uh, through his um, Studio uh, studios, yeah, then he was so impressed that he said, now let's get crack and build a rocket, and can't we synchronize the firing of that rocket with our first 
Yes, the when we uh, show of the movie. Well, uh, Lang saying so made it official, you know. Yeah. The, uh, Obert himself had taken about half of his salary and put it aside for experimental purposes. I see. Mm -hmm. And half of, half of it he used up to live and to support his family. The other half he put aside. Uh, the whole thing then fizzled in some respect. Obert had put his money in that he had saved for the purpose. Fritz Lang had put a su substantial sum in, 26,000 German marks or something like this. And the company was supposed to put the same amount in, but didn't, and did not reimburse Fritz Lang. Oh, who I didn't actually, know that. Who actually financed the first liquid fuel rocket tests in Germany that way. Mm -hmm. Somewhat inadvertently, but he did. <laughs> <laughs> and the, uh, the item you remember from the exhibit in the department store was the so-called Kegeldüse. That's right. Uh, the first European liquid fuel rocket motor. Now, I was present when that Kegeldüse was fired up for the first time. It was in the summer of 1930 on the grounds of the Chemisch Technische Reichsanstalt in Berlin, which yes. is a kind of, uh, oh, something bureau like, of standards. Like our uh, Bureau of Standards. Proving grounds. They had offered over to work in the open area, in the explosive area. And I remember this Kegeldüse was mounted with a nozzle upside so the jet would shoot upwards into a bucket that was filled with water, and that water served for cooling the motor. And uh, there was a little gasoline tank and a little oxygen tank. We worked with liquid oxygen, even then. I know. I was there. And uh, I was only a spectator. You you worked there, but I was I, there. I watched. worked as an apprentice mechanic. So oh, yes, <laughs> yes. I was there, too, as a spectator. Mm. And now this time, I know it was a rainy day. Yes, yes. <laughs> we always had to run for a shelter and then... Well, I remember the very first test with that Kegel Dues that was successful was uh, prepared something like this. We had an old uh, oil-drenched uh, uh, rag that uh, was mounted at the end of a long pole. And uh, Klaus Riedel, you know, yes, uh, had to open the valves. No, I had to open the valves and Klaus Riedel had to... Uh, put that burning uh, petrol-soaked rug over the motor while I was opening the valves, and then Klaus had to jump back behind cover before the thing exploded uh, or, or lit up. And after several tests, it, uh, it started with a big bang, and then we had a run of about 90 seconds duration where, if I remember correctly, seven kilograms of thrust what? produced. Several years earlier, namely in 1926, uh, Robert Goddard had already fired, pre-flight fired, a liquid fuel rocket. We thought we were the first in the world. Oh, yes, yes we were convinced we were because Goddard had done this in March 26, but hadn't published it until 36. Yes. And in this 10-year interval, of course, uh, every little success that we had, we proudly considered a first in history. Yes. Now then, after the experiment with Obert's Kegeldüse, uh, didn't you then go to Switzerland to study for a while? Uh, wait a minute. Um, Obert left us in the f fall of 1930 after the uh, after this German Bureau of Standard had certified him yes. that the Kegeldüse had performed, had yeah. produced these seven kilograms of thrust for 90 seconds. Uh, he, uh, his leave from his uh, school in Romania expired and he decided that he had to go home. His resources were used up, and but he he had uh, achieved what uh, one could expect under the circumstances. And then in fall 1930, his main assistant at that time, Rudolf Nabel, said, let's continue this. I think rocketry is a great thing, and the old man is now going back to Romania, but we don't want the thing to die on the vine here. Yes. And, uh, so uh, Nabel went to a little window shopping in the area, uh, northern Berlin, for a suitable terrain where we could conduct rocket experiments. And a uh, high-pressure salesman that he was, he managed to talk the city administration of Reinickendorf out of about 300 acres of an old abandoned uh, munitions dump or yes. whatever it was. It had been a munitions dump during the First World War. And all he paid for, if I remember, was one mark registration fee for the deal. And then one mark per month, a quarter a month rent. 
I see. Uh, well, uh, that was, of course, outrageous. It was outrageous. <laughs> <laughs> the reason why he got this so cheap was that it had been an ammunition dump. You know, all the buildings were surrounded by high earth walls. And although the land belonged mm -hmm. to the city, the buildings belonged to the army, who would not let anybody touch those earth walls. I see. So it well, was anyway. unsaleable and unrentable. <laughs> Anyway, uh, in the uh, in the fall of thirty, we thereupon started uh, mm, uh, scrounging around for equipment that was put in there. Yes. And uh, in early 1931, the first rocket motors were fired up in this uh, on these grounds. Now, remember that you were present there several times. Oh yes, I was on quite often. As a matter of fact, I often was on when you were not, you know. Yes. <laughs> well, you, you, you were actually with the, uh, you were vice president of the, uh, of the, the parent organization of the yeah. society, so speaking, we were just the field engineers. Well, I was vice president, and for a long time there was no president, <laughs> which <laughs> made my position <laughs> quite strange. <laughs> uh, this design there, this of course was no longer Robert's Kegeldüse, but was this more rounded motor that we yes. used to call the goose egg and names like that. Was that your design? And uh, no, this was uh, mainly Klaus Riedel's design. Well, mainly Klaus Riedel's. Uh, the thing had a very funny history. The way we operated in those days was that neighbor would come home in the evening and say, "Look at here, I uh, uh, I talked one company into giving us these sheets of aluminum." Uh, and uh, this is the material we have, so now let's build a rocket motor. And so Do something with it. You, you virtually designed the rocket motor around the material that Nebel managed to... <laughs> to <laughs> managed to... To, to scrounge. Yes. And uh, another problem then was that we had no aluminum welders in our group. And so what Nebel did was, that, I remember in one of these uh, fishing expeditions, uh, he talked a uh, director of the Siemens company out of a sizable amount of steel welding wire of, for which we had of course no use whatsoever but with that welding wire in his trunk he drove to a welding institute and told them if you would weld our rocket motors for free with your good aluminum welders and you can keep this welding wire so we operated on an essentially cash free basis and uh, really got the job done yes Yes, and then there were the first rocket flights. As a matter of fact, some had perished. Well, now, that, that was a little later. I, yes. I, I, I left for Zurich, Switzerland in, the, uh, in summer 31 for about six months. And when I came back, the first rockets were about ready to fly with the parachute uh, yes. in the tail. You, you, you saw, of course, flights with parachutes. Oh, lots of, them. Yes. lots of them. Yes. I think a total of 85 of these rockets. 85 or 87, I think 87. I remember, because yeah. one of my duties was to edit, the, edit, edit, to write the monthly bulletin. And I, for this reason, I remember these figures somewhat better than you do, because I had to write them down. Of course, it would be kind of misleading if we say now, uh, with that little money, we fired 87 liquid fuel rockets in a day. It costs a million to get a million dollars to get one off the ground. Maybe we should add here that these rockets were rather rudimentary. Yeah, well, well they were no redstones and no Jupiters. <laughs> <laughs> I remember we used an old tire pump to inflate the uh, or to pressurize the fuel tank. Yes. And the LUX tank was merely pressurized by filling it only 30%. And then waiting long enough for evaporation to build up pressure that would provide the pressurization. When the pressure yeah. was just right, then we would open the valves, and then if everything went well, the rocket motor fired up and it would get out of the rack. Yes, I remember in one specific type, it took three minutes and 45 seconds for the oxygen tank to pressurize yes. itself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, Klaus Riedel had a girlfriend, Yes. and, he, uh, and she used to, to sew the parachutes, remember? Yes. She, uh, I think she, she had worked as a seamstress for a while or something. At any rate, she, she, uh, she knew quite well how to make these little parachutes. Yeah, well, she had been had been working in the garment industry, partly as a seamstress, uh, partly as a model. I see. Uh -huh. and so she, she was very pretty. I yeah, remember. and she knew how to put a parachute together. Yes. And we uh, we stuck that parachute into an empty, uh, an empty uh, can. Yes. And uh, it was ex it was expelled uh, by means of a little piston and an explosive charge in the rear. Yes, it was a cork piston, uh, a cork piston with yeah. a little <laughs> black powder to expel it. Hmm. Yeah, and then one of these rockets, one of the bigger types, which needed both hands to lift up, the smaller types could be lifted by a strong man with one hand, uh, then was demonstrated to the German army. 
Yeah. I remember one case before we get to that, yes. incidentally, that uh, Klaus Riedel caught one of these rockets as it parachuted back uh, to the ground in mid-air while standing in the rear of the automobile. In other words, that thing was coming down uh, very close to the launching site, and he, uh, another fellow drove that car right into the, into the, uh, the, the, the pasture there with Klaus Riedel trying to grab that rocket out of the air before it hit the ground would get injured. Yes. And he really caught it there. <laughs> was fired the next day again. I heard that story. I wasn't present when this <laughs> was done, but I know this this was accomplished. <laughs> so all the things that you now have in headlines were done by us then on a small scale. Yes. And sometimes successfully. Yeah. Now, then one of the bigger rockets, uh, the ones that you needed both hands to lift, was demonstrated to the German army. Uh, on that occasion, I was not present. Well, they drove up, uh, had, they had witnesses, I think, several tests. They were always coming in civilian clothes and were just watching. Well, these demonstrations at the testing field, of course, were used to make some money. Uh, engineering societies and other interested people paid one mark each to watch a demonstration. And as we learned later on, there must have been German army personnel not in uniform, of course, who paid one mark to look at all these things. Isn't that how it came about? Yes. Uh, I remember that uh, among the many visitors we had, there were, were three uh, men in Mufti who came in and uh, what looked like a military car with civilian license plates on, and they were greatly interested in what we were doing. And uh, I remember that after a demonstration of one of our little water-cooled motors on the captive test stand, they invited us to give them a free flight demonstration on the Army Proving Ground in Kummerstorf. Yeah, that was one of the long, long ones where the two tanks were on the same axis, wasn't yes. it? Yes. Yes, one after the other. Yeah. This, uh, of course, stop repulsor, repulsor. The one, one mm -hmm. stick repulsor, yes. yes. Well, that uh, demonstration took place in the June of 1932, and it wasn't quite successful. The missile took off all right uh, from the launcher, but having no guidance and having a pretty stiff wind blowing, it veered into the wind, flew horizontal at an altitude of something like five to 800 feet and crashed into the woods about two miles from the launching site. And what happened to the parachute? I think the parachute was still in its casing when it hit the ground because the total flight time wasn't long enough. Oh, I see. So that the this timer to... timing mechanism never had a chance to go into action that, and throw right. it out. Yes. Well, and this, this then was the demonstration which was, in a way, the seed from which everything else... Yes. What happened thereafter was that uh, we, of course, considered the thing a success as far as the demonstration of a liquid fuel rocket in flight was concerned, but the Army wasn't so enthusiastic because we hadn't really delivered the goods and promised what we thought we could do, namely reach an altitude of several miles and then land the thing by parachute. Nevertheless, the army was impressed, but they said um, they didn't like the uh, loud publicity that surrounded our testing field there, and so they said uh, they would support uh, rocket development, the continuation of our liquid rocket development, only if we would accept their terms and move the whole operation behind the fence of an army post. Yes. Although the uh, wisdom of accepting or not accepting this offer, I had a little argument with Mr. Nabel, as we, you will remember. Yes, I know. He felt that we were in a position to impose our conditions on them, and I thought that we were just completely broke, and if we wanted to continue anything, we had to accept it. And Nabel should have realized that the one who has the money is the one who makes the conditions, <laughs> not the, the one who is right. That's the way it seems to be. At any rate, the... Uh, the uh, consequence of the whole thing was that I myself accepted an offer by the Army to work in Kummerstorf on their proving ground on the development of rockets, whereas Nebel continued to uh, work in, uh, on the Reinickendorf field for another two years until he was finally so broke that he had to give up. Yes, until the whole thing collapsed, yes. essentially for lack of cash. Yes. Well, now... Uh, what happened thereafter was, of course, pretty much under wraps, but it didn't start out as a high-priority program by a long shot. I started working for the German army with one mechanic at my disposal, so it was a very humble beginning. Yeah. In, in uh, 19, 
34, we had finally reached the point where we could test fly two small liquid fuel rockets with about 660 pounds of thrust each and 16 seconds burning time. And these uh, two rockets both flew very successfully. They were launched shortly before Christmas 1934 on the island of Borkum in was the North Sea. Was that 34? It was 34. That's right. 34. Yes, 34. Oh, this is the type that was called the A2. The A2, that's right. The A1 was a Kiwi. It never got off the ground, but wasn't supposed to. Yes. Uh, the it, uh, we call these two birds uh, Max and Moritz. In like America, the Katzenjammer kids. Yes. <laughs> and they were the first successful flight, and this was in 34. And then... Well, as a result of that, I got a little more money, because yeah. now it looked like uh, we had made our point... And by 1937, my little experimental station in Kummerstorf had developed into a group of about 80 people. We had three captive test stands at our disposal. Our next ambitious pro uh, program was the so-called A3. That uh, was a completely gyroscopically controlled rocket with jet vanes. We test flew these first A3s in 1937, whereas the power plant was completely successful and the rocket behaved all right uh, structurally, too. Uh, the steering mechanism proved to be a complete failure. Uh, yes, and then that, that was the A3, which yes. behaved as a rocket, but did not behave as a missile. Mm, no, that's uh, <laughs> probably a pretty good <laughs> way of putting it. Well, what happened at that time was that the German Air Force became interested in rocket propulsion, and they looked around and found that we were probably the most advanced group in liquid rocket propulsion, and so the incredible thing happened that the Air Force asked the Army whether they could develop a rocket power plant for airplanes. Now in the Germany of 1937, this is just as incredible as it would happen in this country today. Uh, but it did happen, and we developed this um, power plant, and uh, it was a spectacular success. In 1937, uh, a, an airplane was flown with this 1,000 kilogram or 2,200 pound thrust uh, in the vicinity of Berlin. We also developed for the Air Force, as a result of this work, some J2 uh, rocket uh, assistant takeoff units for heavy bombing aircraft. Um, but uh, the most important aspect of this whole thing is that the Air Force got so hot about rocket development that they said uh, we would like to put this on a larger basis. Yeah. And uh, to my very great surprise, one day they said, uh, why don't you move out of Coma stuff? We give you five million marks to build a bigger facility somewhere else because we know you're too crowded here. That this was an entirely different yeah. ballpark. <laughs> that Air Force engine for this airplane was still made in Coma stuff. That's right. It was yes. still a Coma yes. yes. stuff product. Yes. And now, Werner... You know, I wasn't there anymore. I left in 1935, so to me this is all second-hand information, but I got it from first-class sources, like you, for example. So sometimes I have the feeling that I should remember this myself, but of course I can't. I didn't see it. Yes, uh, the Air Force's interest, actually, in our work in Kummerstorf, broke in late 1935 already. And this development of the airplane power plant, the first air, airplane rocket power plant, was conducted in 36 in Kummerstorf. So then all of a sudden they waved five million marks in the air and said, Yes. Find yourself a bit of bigger place. Yeah, now, uh, when I heard that, I got quite alarmed myself, and I immediately went to my boss in the army and told him that the Air Force wanted to put up five million marks. And uh, I was greatly surprised when... This man, General Becker, said, well, uh, I'm not going to let the Air Force run away with this business. I'm going to be the majority stockholder in this yeah. enterprise. And he, he offered me six million on top of the Air Force's five. So he got in with, with six million additional? Yes. Uh, as a result, we got 11. Well, that what? is how Kuma stuff got, uh, how uh, Pinamunda got started. Yes, I remember that you went around looking for a place first, and then you had something on the island of Rügen in mind, but this couldn't be had anymore. Yes, that uh, had been assigned to some, some other organization in the meantime, we so we finally landed in Pinemünde, but I think it was a better choice, looking back. 
Well, I had that feeling too, you know, after after hearing the story that you originally wanted Rügen, which I admit has is a nicer landscape, you know, where these uh, very lovely there. tall white chalk cliffs yeah. looks very beautiful. Yeah. But on flat pavement, you were probably better off walking. Had more growth potential. Yes. Particularly when it came to building a big airfield and so forth, and all these things paid off quite handsomely later on. Yeah. So this was, now we are in 1937 with our story. And in the spring of 37, we moved into the new facilities of Peenemünde. Now, the A3 had been The A3 fired. just get, got into the test firing uh, phase in the summer of 37. So uh, we brought it over from Kummerstorf. It was essentially completed there, but by early summer 37, we started test firing it. On the grass, the, the finishing, finishing touches came in Penemin, and then <laughs> yes, that's right. Then the firing from the grass while the oil. Uh, there's an interesting little sidelight here, which we might as well tell. Several years earlier, one of the first president of the Society for Space Travel had tried to fire a small rocket, all of five and a half feet tall, from the grass while the oil, which is an island. And permission had been sternly denied because there was a lighthouse on this island and this might be damaged. Uh, you can see that when the army comes and wants to fire something, lighthouses all of a sudden become fireproof and <laughs> <laughs> there's no problem anymore. But yes, go but, on. But I think uh, the, the failure of the guidance system in the A3 proved very clearly that the lighthouse was still endangered. <laughs> However, nothing happened to it. No, I nothing happened to it, but uh, the A3 uh, still uh, was uh, quite a setback for us in the guidance and control area. Yeah. Now, uh, in the meantime, we had already a new design on paper, which was to be something big. The exact specifications hadn't been spelled out yet, but it was supposed to be something at least ten times as large and heavy as the A3, and we had called that A4. The A4... A nomenclature later on got stuck to the, what became the V2. So uh, as a result of all this, and uh, the, um, ad, uh, the improved A3 that finally emerged from the original failures of the A3 got the name A5 because we felt the reputation of the name A3 was so down... That you know, might as well... ...bottom that we had to rechristen it somehow. Call it so something we, else to make it look better. Yes. So we called it A5, and the A5 was essentially an improved A3 with the guidance system uh, perfected on static test stands and on electronic simulators and so forth. And this A5 was test flown at first without a control system in 38 and with a complete guidance and control system in the spring of 39. And that proved to be a complete success. Yes, and that the guidance system then was the essentially the one that went into the A4? That was later on used in the A4 with some modifications. Yeah. You see, the A5 had only a range of approximately 16 miles or a, could reach a vertical altitude of approximately 10 miles, so it wasn't exactly a long-range ballistic missile, but the guidance system still had all the main features that the A4 or V2 yeah. guidance system had later on. Embodied all the principles which That's were right. then used. Yes. Now, that was... Uh, that was which, uh, summer 39, the... Uh, test program of the yeah. A5 uh, yes. wound up with a complete success. Now yeah. then, as you will remember, in the September, in, on the 1st of September, 39, Hitler invaded Poland yeah. and the war broke out. And uh, that uh, put the whole uh, endeavor at Pienemünde on a very different footing. The, uh, uh, the army told us in... Uh, very clear terms that either we had to produce something of promise as a weapon in the very near future or we might as well go out of business. And so we uh, took a look at our old uh, design studies on what we had called the A4 and asked for exact weapon specifications. And uh, it might interest you that the weapon specification for what became the V2 were simply developed as follows. We said we better stick to the aerodynamic configuration of the A5 in order to save new wind tunnel studies and so forth. And so what was the biggest uh, A5 configuration that could be uh, shipped through a railroad tunnel? Yes, uh, I, I know that. Sometimes thing hinges on things like the curve of a railroad, yes. uh, what length you can transport, or yes. what tunnels have to be gone through. 
So the army asked us how, how much, uh, how far could such a thing fly and how much payload could it carry. And we said uh, a configuration, uh, an enlarged configuration of the A5 uh, could carry one metric ton of payload over 275 kilometers range, which yeah. is about 200 miles. And uh, on this basis, the army endorsed the um, specification that how the V2 got rolling. Yes, and you had the first successful test shot on, uh, was this 43, October? No, 42. 42. 42. Uh, throughout 1940 and 41, the components of the V2 were developed and captive tests were carried out with and without controls. For example, we had the whole V2 mounted in gimbal rings on the test stand and tested the controls with jet vanes and everything on the captive test stand. In June 1942, we made the first free flight test, which was a failure. The second was also a failure, or at least a part failure. It reached supersonic speed and then broke up. And the third one, on the 3rd of October 1942, finally, was a full success and traveled over, uh, I think, 120 miles or so. It still wasn't yes. full range yet because it had heavier tanks and a heavier structure, but otherwise it was a full success. Otherwise it was a full success. So this was late in 42. October 42, yeah. yes. Yes, I know, October 3rd, 42. I remember this because later on when I read about this, I said he could have shot this one day earlier for my birthday. <laughs> but then after all, the Russians were two days off with the first artificial satellite, still one day later. Uh, at that time, approximately, uh, the V1 must have come in as a competitor, didn't it? Not yet. Not um, yet. The V1 had a, a somewhat interesting story. The V1 started out as a propulsion project only, originally. That was this uh, um, resonant uh, ramjet. Yes, the uh, pulse jet. The uh, pulse jet, as it was called. called. And very early in the game, the, uh, the support of this uh, power plant development was actually a joint effort between the Air Force and my own department in the German Ordnance Corps. So I actually furnished some money for that development. Uh, I see. And it was only in 1942 or 41 or thereabouts where a policy meeting took place between the German Air Force and the German Army about which, uh, what service should do what kind of development in the missile field. Yes. In the meantime, it had become evident that this pulse jet was a logical power plant for an air breather type winged missile. It was not so attractive for aircraft as had originally been thought. Mm. Yeah. And the, the, the uh, agreement that was finally reached simply provided that the Air Force would handle winged vehicles that travel through the atmosphere and the Army would uh, develop ballistic missiles uh, having no wings and flying yeah. ballistic yeah. trajectories. Yeah. And so uh, the Army, the Air Force, that had a design on ballistic missiles too for a while, gave up their ballistic missile project, and we gave up the pulse jet development and turned that over to the Air Force. Well, after the power plant uh, was in workable shape for the V-1, the Air Force looked for an airframe contractor and brought the Fieseler company in. And they, they built the airframe, and that's how the V-1 was born. Yes, what I am aiming at here is very simply the fact that at one time then, after both existed, the question came up, which one should now be used or which one should be produced? Yes, there was uh, a, uh, an evaluation uh, firing at Peenemünde. The V1s were also test-fired over our same range at Peenemünde because we had all the instrumentation in there, and the V1, having been a contractor's development, didn't have any separate range facilities, so they were brought to Peenemünde and fired from the northern tip of, uh, of the island over the same range. And I remember very well that there was an evaluation committee there, and there were V1s in the air and V2s in the air, and the committee simply uh, didn't know what to do at the end. After they had been sufficiently deafened by rocket motors and pulse jets, yes. they decided that both should be produced. They finally decided to continue with both. Uh, because it wasn't quite clear yet whether there would be any any uh, unforeseen snags by putting these missiles into production. We also were unable, and that goes, bo goes for both of them, uh, to demonstrate the target accuracy of the two systems. And so uh, 
there was probably no other choice but just to continue but both just... of them in order to make sure that at least one of them would work. Keep going and, and hope that both were, but be reasonably sure that one might. Yes, that was about it. And, uh, well, then, of course, the V2 group ran into unforeseen problems with the uh, uh, break-up before striking the yes, target. Yes, um, uh, what happened was that up to the first successful flight of the V2, we really never had any high-level support for the V2 program because uh, the thought was widespread and Hitler himself uh, uh, felt that way about it, that uh, this would be impossible to build a thing like the V2. Mm. And so uh, uh, we really didn't get full support. Now, after we demonstrated that the thing did work, the official position from upstairs changed 180 degrees, and all of a sudden we were directed to go into mass production, for which we were not ready either. Yeah, yeah. Because there were many, many problems still to be solved, but this created an entirely new set of difficulties. Mm. And uh, the V2 then was put into mass, mass production, immature as it was, and when we finally made evaluation tests with the, with the field troops who were to fire it and employ it operationally, we found out our great disappointment that uh, about 70% of these V2s disintegrated before they hit the ground. We hadn't discovered that Pinamunda because we had always impacted on water. I was just going to say they may have done this earlier too, but you always were shooting out roughly parallel to the coastline and yes. the impact was in water and nobody around to watch it. We saw a green spot there and were always delighted when it was uh, close to the, to the target. But uh, there was no evidence available about any premature breakups. Yeah. And only when the uh, operational testing, which was combined with field training of the operational firing units, was conducted in eastern Poland, and they put yeah. some evaluation groups there into the Pripyat swamps. And yes, they And did. in eastern Poland, they discovered yeah. that many of these missiles broke up prematurely. Mm. Well, that I got a telegram one fine day that uh, this observation had been made, that 70% uh, broke up prematurely and uh, what we planned to do about it because the production line was going full blast already and at that point we simply resolved let's go in there to the ta into the target area and let's get uh, let ourselves get shot at so that we could observe these yes. things on the way down to, to see what happened and evaluate the debris yeah and I lived there for about two weeks and we got shot at at a rate of about 10 a day always live warhead yes. heads for that yeah. matter so I can really say I know the V2 not only from the delivering end, but quite intimately also from the receiving end. <laughs> you know end. it from both ends. Which was your closest miss? Uh, 300 feet. 300 yeah, feet. It, well, it really this is it was pretty close. Close enough <laughs> for anybody. We, yeah. had a, we had a joke in those days that the, that the purpose of the exercise with these missiles was to make the uh, target more dangerous than the launching site. Now, many mishaps, of course, happened in the launching site also, and I think the argument was never quite settled as to whether the V-2 ever uh, got to the point where the uh, target was really more dangerous than the launching site. Well, no, you couldn't expect this with the first one. Now, all this then ended in, as far as you are concerned, when were the first operational shots the, in September? That was in September 1954. Four, uh, 44. September 1944. Yes. And then you left Peenemünde when? Um, in January 1945, the, uh, uh, the war situation had developed to a point where the Russian armies had already crossed the Vistula River and were in the eastern part of Pomerania. And at night we could already hear the guns. Yeah. Uh, about uh, 100 miles away or so. Yeah. And at that point, it was pretty evident that uh, if we wanted to get out there before the Russian armies moved in, we had to move fast. We were under very conflicting orders at that time from all kinds of agencies in Germany as to what to do. Mm. For example, the local uh, authorities said, you stay here and defend the Pomeranian soil. They didn't tell us with what, because we had no arms. The... Uh, the uh, munitions department in Berlin told us to move out. Other people wanted us uh, to stay put and continue development because the Russians would be reversed very shortly. So we really could take our pick. You could pick the T-34 
take the order that, that uh, yes. happened to fit in with your personal well, preference. Well, what, what I actually yeah. did was I assembled my department heads and simply put the question to a vote. And we yeah. voted unanimously to move out before it was too late and uh, try to move towards the west uh, in the direction of where the American army was moving in. Now, this was, of course, uh, not quite easily accomplished because the, uh, there was this rapidly deteriorating situation on the inner front and all the roads were clogged with refugees and with supply vehicles for the fighting uh, army units in the vicinity and so forth and so we uh, virtually bluffed our way through with flashing high priority move orders under the noses of the guards and so forth but okay. we finally managed to move about 5,000 people and 12,000 tons of equipment out of Pinamunda the heavy equipment mostly being evacuated over the waterway, I mean the ships, yeah, yes. to Lubeck. Now about 2,000 tons of that equipment finally reached White Sands and was the hard core of our early V2 test program. Oh, of that Sands. equipment, uh, much right. of this still got to White Sands. Yes, yes. But you personally went to Bavaria. Yes. And this, uh, we uh, were finally split up again when we arrived in central Germany and part of us were sent down under orders to Bavaria because uh, they, they didn't want us to be so close to the western front line now but yeah. in the meantime the war ended and finally we were captured by the American army practically two days after the hostilities had ended. We virtually surrendered. Uh, we came down from the hills and said here we are. The war is over. The next big event after Peenemünde is known as White Sands. White Sands had been selected here in the United States during the last year of the Second World War, but in the United States only one rocket, which needed a proving ground of roughly that size, had been built, namely the WAC Corporal, and the WAC Corporal actually was the first rocket to be fired from the White Sands proving ground. But then the White Sands proving ground being only 120 miles in its long direction, which is from north to south, rapidly became too small because now the V2s and Werner von Braun had moved in. You were at Fort Bliss then, weren't you, Werner? Yes. Uh, I uh, arrived in White Sands in October 1945, and uh, the first half here actually lived at the White Sands Proving Ground proper. Only thereafter we moved to Fort Bliss, which is only about 50 miles away, and there's nothing in Texas. No, uh, of course uh, not. So it was commuting distance. Um, our first activity, when I say ours, I mean mine and that of the 120 associates from Pinamunda I was uh, permitted to bring along to the United States, uh, was to fire V2s in White Sands. The purpose of the exercise was uh, uh, twofold. One was that the army wanted to know everything about the V-2 and simply wanted to evaluate the V-2 missile uh, to, to learn all about it. The second was that these flights, which due to the limitations of the White Sand Range had to be high altitude flights, rather steep trajectories, were an ideal tool to do some high altitude research. And so uh, the United States Army invited a number of universities to participate in this effort to, de to develop scientific payload, pa payload packages that could be carried in the nose of V2s to uh, conduct measurements about the nature of the very high atmosphere. Yes, I remember I saw number 14, which had been instrumented by Princeton University. Mm. Uh, number 14, I don't know whether you recall the number of hand, unfortunately did not go to a high altitude, but put itself horizontal about 700 feet up and coasted oh. over our heads. Some of them did it. Which was very spectacular, I must <laughs> say. It didn't do any good, but it was a beautiful picture. Well, but then, after the V2s were used up, I mean, the question then, which was discussed by everybody I know of, was should we in the United States build more V2s or go on to something different. And I understand that you yourself voted in the direction of going on to something different. Yes, the V2 of course by that time wa was an old workhorse and uh, uh, it was uh, certainly a good idea to start with a new concept and uh, build an advanced missile and rather than tooling up the V2 for production again.
Yes, and the... Nevertheless, the V2 itself, of course, uh, helped a great deal uh, providing uh, basic information for such advanced designs. For example, we uh, built a two-stage vehicle consisting of a V2 as a first stage and the WEC Corporal as the second stage, which uh, cracked the world altitude record in 1949 by reaching an altitude of 250 miles. Yes, that was Project Bumper. Yes. Uh, number five was the one that went to 250 miles, I think. Yes, it wasn't the first bump. And it, it was, was not the, the first, bumpers. it was number right. five. Yes. And then number eight and nine, of course, have another historical significance. They were the first two missiles fired from Cape Canaveral. That is right. They were fired into slanting trajectories. The purpose of these two flights was not to go after high altitudes, but to measure heat transfer at very high speeds when these vehicles, the second stage in particular, travel through the atmosphere. Yes. And uh, they produced some very valuable data, too. I would say, by and large, this whole V2 program in the United States was very gratifying for me because uh, in Germany, the V2, for all its potential as a scientific vehicle carrier, was, of course, used as a weapon only, the country being at war. And uh, this period in the United States, where a total of, I think, over 60 V2s were fired, uh, gave the V2 a chance as serving as a valuable scientific tool also, which had always been pretty close to our heart in yes. all these mm. years, but we never had a chance of... Now some research could be yes, done with the yes, thing, precisely. and something fundamental could be learned. Yes. So then after the bumper, the two-stage vehicle, the first, uh, to my knowledge, first two-stage liquid fuel rocket, where both stages were liquid fuel. Was the bumper whack. Was the That's bumper the whack. Uh, yes. whack corporal combination, yes. After that, the next one was which? Well, as far as our group's concerned, we uh, uh, were transferred to Redstone Arsenal, Huntsville, Alabama, where we are now. That was in the spring of 1950. And simultaneously with this transfer, we got a new assignment, namely to develop the Redstone uh, liquid fuel rocket. Yes. The Redstone, as you know, is now in the hands of the troops. Several units are deployed in Europe under the NATO organization. And this was the first operational, excuse me, no, the second operational liquid fuel rocket in this country. The, the first was the Corporal, which was an advanced VAC. Uh, WAC corporal, but with a complete guidance system yeah. in it, and uh, an improved WAC corporal, weapon, uh, weaponized, yes. as we say, it was yes. transferred into a weapon which is, was never intended to be uh, in the, at the outset of the program. No, because the WAC corporal went the other way around. This was meant to be a high altitude research that rocket, is right. and then turned into a weapon. What happened was that when the Korean War broke out. Uh, and uh, the country awoke to the fact that uh, we couldn't lower our guards anymore because the Russians had not demilitarized their army when the war was over. Uh, a uh, guided missile Tsar was appointed in the Department of Defense, and he took stock of what capabilities he had, and he decided the weaponization of the corporal would be the fastest solution to give this country a long-range weapon, and uh, the second a logical step would be to have our group develop the Redstone. Yes. And this is how we got the assignment. And now the Redstone is still of a range comparable to that of the V2. Yes. A few hundred miles. It carries a lot more uh, payload weight, however. Well, it's much bigger. I can yes. testify yes. to that. Yes. yes. Uh, but the next after that, then, is the Jupiter. Yes. Or was there anything in between? No, we uh, received the assignment to develop the Jupiter in 1955. Originally, it was supposed to be an Army 1,500-mile missile, but the operational use of this, uh, that uh, missile was later on turned over to the Air Force, but we continued the development nevertheless, and it's now being fielded by the Air Force. Yes, and I have found out that the public is confused between the Jupiter and the Jupiter C. Well, that's a rather amusing story. <clears throat> In order to develop the Jupiter IRBM, the Jupiter 1500-mile missile, efficiently, we had to solve the nose cone problem. That is, we had to come up with a design for the nose cone, or the envelope of the warhead, which uh, would be capable of taking the severe aerodynamic heating during re-entry into the atmosphere. 
Now, there were two possibilities. Either we waited for the Jupiter missile itself to be available and use the Jupiter IRBM as a test carrier for its own nose cone. In this case, of course, any delays occurring in the nose cone development would have delayed the entire program. The other alternative would have been to uh, come up with a temporary vehicle capable of also hurling some kind of a payload over 1,500 miles range and use this temporary vehicle to develop the nose cone parallel to the development of the Jupiter rocket itself. And this temporary vehicle could be a redstone, which we had in those days, plus a two-stage solid rocket cluster in the nose of a redstone. This vehicle had a capability of not throwing a 3,000-pound payload over the full 1,500-mile range as the Jupiter could, but about one-tenth of that, namely 300 pounds. So you could make scale tests yes. to develop the nose cone. Now, when we submitted this plan to the Department of Defense, we were told that uh, this was fine and good, but the Jupiter enjoyed a higher priority than the Redstone, and I, th I think they suspected us of sneaking the Redstone project into the Jupiter priority by proposing this. So they said, if you want to use some Redstones in support of the Jupiter program, you have to earmark those red stones and give them somehow a Jupiter nomenclature so that we can identify them clearly and uh, tell them from the rest of the red stones which do not enjoy this priority. So we called it the Jupiter Composite Missile, and that's how the name Jupiter C came about. Mm, I see there are not only engineering difficulties, but also legal fight points. This is a case of uh, political or legal engineering. <laughs> yes, <laughs> which have to be navigated through. Yes. But then the Jupiter C, of course, through the Explorer satellites. Yes, uh, this um, came about as follows. Um, we had made several tests with this three-stage Jupiter C configuration in support of the Jupiter nose cone development program uh, when the Sputniks appeared in the sky. And then, as you will remember, our answer to the Sputniks at that time was the Vanguard missile which was a very advanced and highly sophisticated vehicle, but was brand new at that time. It didn't have much testing on, and so to nobody's surprise, the early tests weren't completely successful. Well, as a matter of fact, it was quite interesting that these preliminary so-called TVs, the test vehicles of the Vanguard, which were only one stage at the time, they all worked out nicely, but when the thing was put together, it stumbled over its own tail fins, which it doesn't have. Well, uh, this is usually what happens early in the program. And of course, when you work in a military missile program, you have the advantage that you don't have to advertise your failures so loudly as if you work in the glare of the yes. uh, public limelight by firing satellites. Yes, well, uh, I think we both agree that the main thing that was wrong with the Vanguard is that it was much too new. Precisely, precisely. Uh, as later flights have demonstrated, the Vanguard was entirely capable of doing what it was, what what it was what advertised, it was, uh, advertised, to, advertised do. to do. And you give the Vanguard another 20 or 30 flights, and uh, it'll be a highly reliable vehicle, too. Yes. But you just can't force these things. Uh, it still takes nine months to get a baby, <laughs> and the same goes for uh, guided missiles, too. Uh, only it's not nine only months, <laughs> but three to four years. <laughs> I was just going to say, only the gestation period is considerably longer. Yes. Well, now, as a result of this, if I uh, may hook on to your remark about satellites, uh, as a result of the public pressure to put something up in orbit, the Department of Defense finally called us in and said, uh, we understand your Jupiter C re-entry vehicles have a satellite capability if you replace a nose section by a fourth stage, and they can still orbit something like 20 to 30 pounds. So let's get going. Mm. And uh, with all the previous work already being completed, we were actually able to fire this first thing into orbit within 84 days from the word go. Yes, I know you referred to it as in 80 days around the world. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, well, now, since we are talking about satellites, we're beginning to get into the future. There have been all kinds of satellites up so far, all sizes, shapes, different fuels having been used, and it is, of course, absolutely no secret 
And I saw it here. It is no secret to the extent that I saw it in your Redstone morning paper this morning when I arrived here at Huntsville, Alabama, that you are coming up with something super colossal called the Saturn. Yes, um, the Saturn is our first big step into the real high thrust area. Our ICBMs, which of course are substantially larger and heavier than even our Jupiter IRBM, still have a thrust, total thrust, of uh, well under 500,000 pounds. Now the Saturn will have one and a half million. Yes. It will be powered by eight engines similar to those used in the Jupiter, the Jupiter having, of course, only one of them. Yes. These engines will, each of these engines will even give a little more thrust than the one engine in the Jupiter. So with eight of these engines, we have about ten times more thrust at the Jupiter. Mm-hmm. Coming out to about one and a half million pounds. One and a half million pounds, yes. And then what is done with this depends, of course, entirely on what is put on top of this. Yes. Now, uh, we will put on top of it a Titan first stage. In other words, uh, the whole ICBM, ti- the, the whole first stage of the ICBM Titan. Yes. That's the second stage. And on yes. top of that will uh, sit a third stage, and if it's a high-speed deep space mission, maybe even a fourth stage. If necessary, a fourth one. That can be uh, tailored to the needs of the customer, so to speak. Yes. In this respect, we're quite flexible. Well, yes, uh, and this is is what I like about this idea, that you have here a very heavy, very powerful first stage which can carry almost anything desired, and it doesn't always have to be the same thing. No. With this... uh, ability to do almost anything the customer wants, uh, what is the first objective? Well, the very immediate objective of the uh, Saturn project is to provide the transportation vehicle for a global communication system. Uh, Specifically, we are to fire three satellites into a 24-hour orbit in the equatorial plane. A 24-hour orbit is an orbit with an altitude of approximately 19,000 nautical miles above the surface of the Earth. Yes. If in the equatorial plane you fire such a satellite in the west to east direction, then the satellite will come to a standstill over a certain point of the equator. The Earth rotates about its axis also once in 24 hours, so if the satellite's uh, period of revolution is 24 hours, it will be relative stand still over a distinct over point on a, Earth. Over a point on the yes. equator. Now, if you put three such satellites into the same orbit, all 24-hour orbits, all in the equatorial plane, and you space these three satellites 120 degrees apart in their orbit, then uh, at this distance from the Earth, each of these satellites will be able to see the two others in an optical line of sight. At the same time, these uh, satellites uh, will be in permanent line of sight contact with a tremendous area on the globe. And in fact, there will be no point on Earth that is not in direct line of sight contact with at least one of them. Yes. That means if you want to make a telephone call, say, from New York to Paris, then uh, one satellite may be in simultaneous line of sight contact with both New York and Paris, and you just send your radio message, your telephone, up to the satellite, and the satellite beams it back down onto Paris, and you speak in direct line of sight contact. Yes. With the satellite working as a kind of a repeater station. Yes. If you want to telephone, say, from San Francisco with Paris, where you may be too far away to see the same satellite, then San Francisco beams its message up to the satellite in line of sight contact from San Francisco. The one they can see. Yes. That satellite beams it over to the other satellite that can be seen from Paris, and that satellite beams down to Paris. The advantage of this scheme is the following. There is no real difficulty in providing communications on the same continent. For example, if you want to telephone from New York to San Francisco, you can uh, use the wires and uh, pick uh, up the uh, phone, and, and uh, you can uh, even uh, use uh, multiple channel uh, telephone with carrier frequencies over the wire, and there are lots of connections. So there's no real problem in providing more traffic, um, more service for more telephone traffic. 
The moment you have to cross oceans, the situation is quite difficult and different. Either you have to put cables in the water, which is a very costly thing, and gives you only a few leads anyway, or you depend on low-frequency radio transmission, unless you want to go to uh, ionospheric scatter radio, which is utterly unreliable. Yes. Now, that low-frequency radio communication presents you with the problem that the frequency spectrum is very limited. And even with all the tricks at our disposal today, such as single sideband reception, suppressed carriers, and so forth, we simply cannot accommodate more traffic on that limited f spectrum. Yes. But you are <coughs> depending on these waves because they are the only ones who follow the curvature of the Earth. If you want to go to short waves and microwaves, you are limited by the fact that these waves, like light, mm. propagate only along straight lines, and they do not follow the curvature of the Earth. But the spe uh, frequency spectrum in that area is virtually unlimited because you can put a lot of uh, frequencies very close together without interference. So you can, uh, by establishing a communications satellite system where you beam messages up to the satellite and the satellite beams it back down to another point on the Earth, you can uh, uh, expand our present transoceanic telephone connections a hundredfold or a thousandfold without any great difficulties. Yes, this scheme, of course, has been talked about in circles of space travel enthusiasts and rocket engineers for some time, but you say that this is actually the this first is, use to which the Saturn will be put. This is now an established program, and all the money we are getting for the Saturn uh, comes out of this kitty. In other words, mm -hmm. we are getting it for the specific purpose of providing this country with such a communication satellite yes. system. This, of course, is completely unmanned. This is a fully automatic system. Yes, it will be a fully automatic system, but it's quite conceivable that as the need for more traffic increases, say, if the television networks wants to pick up the idea and say, now we want to provide global television service with that same system, it may well be that the units going around there in that 24-hour orbit will become bigger and bigger, and finally you will, may even want to have a maintenance crew up there. Uh, that's how people may still get into the act. Uh, you mean simply by enlargement, and, and then at one time they get to be too large and too complicated to be completely trustworthy, well, uh, without maintenance. I wouldn't put it this way. Suppose you have either three very large communication satellites up there, or a great number of little ones, then you may reach a point where it may pay off to repair and maintain these things by sending manned repair crews out there, or even having people live there more or less permanently to keep these things in shape. Yes. And uh, a vehicle like the Saturn, of course, cannot only carry dead equipment up there, but it can very definitely also send manned capsules up there with repair crews that would be capable of returning to the Earth again. I think when we talk about manned space flight, uh, the first attempt in this direction, the first serious attempt, will be the uh, uh, so-called Project Mercury, which is a program supported and financed and sponsored by the National Space Administration. Uh, under program uh, Mercury, it is planned to fire a manned capsule uh, with an Atlas vehicle into a low orbit and let the capsule pilot go around the Earth several times and then, with the help of a retardation maneuver, this nose cone will slip back into the atmosphere, will be retarded by aerodynamic drag and finally land in the water where it will be, shipped in there, where it will be fished out of the water like our Jupiter nose cones with the monkeys aboard. Yes. Uh, this will definitely be man's first step into an orbit, and from there on, uh, it doesn't take much imagination to see that with a big booster like the Saturn at the bottom of such a vehicle, you need not limit this to one man, but you can send a whole busload of people up into an orbit. Yes, and uh, well, what I mainly mean, meant to point out was this, that the space station, as it has been discussed before, which has as its main job the observation of the Earth, uh, will be in a rather low orbit, while the communication satellites, the telephone satellites, let's call them, have to be some 22,000 miles away. 
Yes, actually, there is a question of uh, whether it is realistic to talk about just one space station. Uh, it depends very much on uh, uh, what the purpose of such a station is. Uh, uh, shall we say the choice of the orbit of a space station depends very much on its purpose. Yes. For example, if you want to use a space station to uh, 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 maintain a continuous surveillance of the weather development on Earth, then it is uh, very important to put these uh, uh, such a satellite, such a space station, into a very uh, uh, into a near polar orbit, so that you can see the weather developments over the polar areas also. Yeah. Yes, it would also have an orbit uh, differently located, so to speak, with respect to the Earth. Uh, the telephone satellites would be over the equator. That is right. Uh, well, this one should go over the poles or very near the poles. Yes. But what I've said first is that it also would be much nearer to the ground. Yes, I think uh, both is correct. Uh, my point is uh, I think there may be several satellites for several applications. There may be manned space stations for, for uh, in connection with the communication satellite project in the future, and there may be lower uh, space stations going over polar orbits uh, which for weather observation, yeah, and there may be others in between. Earth watch, you know, polar orbit replaced the iceberg patrol at the same time. Yes. Weather reporting, uh, even... Oh, what might or be... for military uh, observation of military purposes, observing. you want to have highly inclined orbits yes. too, so you can yes. cover the northern and the southern hemispheres. And they could take in what, what might be called accident reporting, you know, yes. for example, a wrecked ship or things yes. like this. Yes. They could report yes. on that. Now, these would go very nearly over the poles, if not over the poles, and would be quite close. Uh, then, is there any reason for having something at an intermediate distance? Let's say if this Earth Watch satellite, as I like to call it, is in a 400-mile orbit. Well, I think uh, we have to watch the Van Allen belt. Yes, we sure the do. The Van Allen belt uh, begins at, a, at an altitude of approximately 700 miles and uh, stretches out to altitudes very close to, uh, to those uh, envisioned for the uh, communication satellite. Yes. Uh, whereas, whereas it uh, doesn't uh, seem to be too difficult to penetrate the Van Allen belt in a fast uh, departure, say, to the moon or the planets, where your stay time in the Van Allen belt would be quite limited, uh, there seems to be a major problem of leaving a permanent manned space station right in the Van Allen belt. You would yeah. have to provide so much shielding that uh, the weight penalty is yeah. too high. At the moment, it does not look impossible, but it certainly looks impracticable. Yes, in other words, uh, the way it looks today is uh, you either you stay below it, which means uh, below 700 miles approximately, or you just go uh, much further Beyond out. 20,000. It's, it's unless you have very good reasons yeah. to build a well-shielded uh, yeah. space station right within the Van Allen belt, you, uh, it is just not too attractive. No, it's, it's a little bit like the speed of sound. Uh, at point eight of the speed of mm. sound, everything is fine. At one point two, everything is fine again, but yes. not in between. Only this belt is a lot wider. It's a lot wider. Well, uh, the only reason I could see for a heavily shielded station in the belt would be one designed to observe the belt itself. And I think that could be done without a man station. Yes, uh, actually, the human body has no... Uh, sensors to give you any of the information you want. What we would like to find out right now, for example, is what is the percentage of protons and electrons in this belt? What is their energy spectrum and so forth? Now, the human body Which has the no... the human observer couldn't do any anyway. ...organs. You may be able to kill a man in that belt, but you still... Uh, he still wouldn't know what exactly killed him. So you need instrumentation to give you this kind of information, and there's no reason why this cannot be radioed down to the ground from an unmanned satellite. Uh, with reference to the first man in orbit, the flight of the astronaut, uh, will he be carried into orbit by an Atlas missile, so to speak, cold, or will he have previous experience on a smaller scale? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, the National Space uh, Administration have, has actually called us here at Huntsville in to provide... Uh, some hardware for the initial training flights of these astronauts. 
The plan is to put the man right from the beginning into the ultimate capsule, which will later on be used for the orbital flights with atlases. But his first flights will be conducted from the nose of a redstone vehicle only over a range of approximately 150 to 200 miles. In this fashion, we will give him a six-minute ride through the zero-gravity condition and a typical re-entry with ensuing parachute landing and being fished out of the water. In short, the North Cone ride in a red storm will provide him more or less with the experience except that the zero-G period, which he would spend in orbit, has been trimmed from... Pretty good feeling of what he will be up against uh, when he finally boards that atlas. And uh, will they all get the... Since, uh, since it is not certain, and I understand it will not be certain until fairly much the last moment which one actually goes into orbit. Will they all get such a North Korean iron? I think this is uh, to be expected, yes. We are furnishing several redstone vehicles, and it's of course entirely up to the NASA, to the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, to decide who will take the first ride. Yes, but I mean, they, they will have had several people who had the North Korean ride in preparation for the orbital flight. Yes, you see, this is necessary to have several test pilots standing by because you have to be in perfect physical conditions for these early tests and it can always be that uh, a man catches a cold and everything else has been prepared, the ships are in position and the man wakes up with a, with a head cold and doesn't qualify that day. In this case, uh, the number two man will be slipped in. Now, in talking about the investigation of the Van Allen layer, which is a most interesting, if unexpected, item that we didn't know about a few years ago, uh, you said that for this particular observation, instruments are far superior to men because men happens to lack the organ which could make the determination, which could make the discoveries, if you want, that the instruments can. This, of course, brings up the general question of when is man needed in space? Where does he have to step in because his instruments now don't do the job anymore? Well, I think very fundamentally, the uh, 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 instrumentation has its limits. You can design instrumentation for a known objective. You have to specify in advance what information you seek and then build your instrumentation accordingly so that it furnishes you with the answers. So be you have to know what to look for in order to ask intelligent questions via the instrument. Precisely. Design. And so, uh, as I see it, man is necessary wherever you are confronted with a great unknown, where you just don't know what to look for and where you expect the unexpected, against which you cannot design any machinery. Just to illustrate yes. my point, uh, Suppose uh, we were living on another star and wanted to find out what life, what kind of life exists in the Brazilian jungles. And you would have to s build a telemeter package to furnish you all the answers about snakes and birds and uh, crocodiles, but also bacteria and insects and, and, insects and, do these insects and everything. Eat other insects mm -hmm. or plants. And the uh, question of contagious diseases and what have you in the Brazilian jungles, you'd be uh, confronted with a rather formidable problem because not knowing what to expect, you couldn't design this machinery to meet all your objectives and as a result, the old-fashioned method of the, uh, method of the Spanish explorers but just sending a man there for a look-see is still the most effective. Yes, and of course now we would see to it that this man is well protected or as well protected as we can, can make it, but it is then inherently the higher versatility of the brain over the instrument which counts. Wherever you need judgment, wherever you need coordination of several apparently irrelevant and in uh, disconnected pieces of information and put a story together out of a number of apparently independent inputs, the human brain still cannot be beat. Cannot be beat, no, and won't be for a long time. No, I think never will. Now this gets us to the next topic. Uh, we can penetrate the Van Allen there. We can go out farther into space. Where will we go first? Well, I think uh, in the area of deep space penetration, uh, the most logical step after manned orbital flight 
and sea for return from orbital flight has been uh, uh, obtained and demonstrated, we will probably expect to send a few uh, men around the moon on a long stretched flight path behind the uh, unknown far side of the moon and return them back into the Earth's atmosphere with an ensuing aerodynamic deceleration and landing. Now, such yeah. a flight would not include a landing on the surface of the moon. No. It would be essentially a high-speed power maneuver on the outbound leg to get us that far out. And then as the rocket comes almost to a standstill behind the moon, the moon would sweep through between rocket and uh, Earth. Uh, Earth. And uh, then it would fall back uh, towards the Earth under the gravitational pull of the Earth and would tangentially sweep into the Earth's atmosphere and land. Yes, so the first deep space trip for people is still, as we said many years ago, the trip flight around, around the, moon. the moon without landing. Yes. yes. Then, of course, when it comes to the neighboring planets, we have this nice toss-up that we know nothing about Venus at the moment, so this makes it more interesting, but we don't know what to protect against. Well, Mars doesn't look very hospitable, but at least we know a lot about it. Yes. Well, as far as the, uh, 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 as far as flights to Venus and Mars is concerned, the difficulties are about equal. It is a little closer to Venus to get there than to Mars, but Venus has a, a stronger gravitational field of her own, so it takes a little more velocity to uh, put a rocket, say, into orbit around Venus than it would cost to put it around in orbit around Mars. Yes. So it is about, it's about equal. Yes, in, in spite of the somewhat greater distance to Mars, the engineering problem is very much the same, and the fuel problem is likely to yes. be very much the same. And uh, as you just said, in the case of Mars, due to the fact that the atmosphere is transparent, we know a little better how to equip our machinery, how to build our automatic instrumentation to give us more information on Mars. Yes, we know what questions to ask. For example, uh, photographing Mars surface from an orbit around Mars would be a very interesting thing and we would know right now how to design such equipment. We could entirely envision televising such pictures back to the Earth and give us some answers to such riddles as do the marching canals really exist? Are they canals? Are they canals are they? or what are they? Whereas in the case of Venus, it would probably be necessary to send a kind of a glide bomb into the Venus atmosphere with television equipment and see whether that thing ever comes out of the Venus atmosphere and take some pictures on what's underneath or whether it'll crash in the ground without yes, and telling us anything, thus indicating that the clouds go all the way down to the ground. Yes, in other words, the... Uh, we do know enough about Mars to design equipment. In the case of Venus, we first would have to gather experience. Yes. We would have to oh, almost engineer a number of failures in order to know how to avoid them. Yes, yes. And then, of course, man flight to these neighboring planets would follow these unmanned probes, which have given the final information. Yes, I think to the planets, we should expect unmanned probes first, maybe even one-way probes just go out to the planet, either pass those planets in a, in a close pass or go in orbit around these planets and televise their information and telemeter their information back to the Earth. Yes. And man, mm -hmm. of course, will follow as man always has. Yes. And uh, now we come to a semi-philosophical question. What right does man have in space? Well, uh, it has been stated that we don't belong there because uh, outer space is a realm of God and we better stay on this uh, earth. I, I don't like the implication of these statements because uh, it could be construed as to mean that the earth itself does not belong to the realm well, of God. If you permit me to interrupt you, this is precisely the answer I gave once at a meeting where somebody came up with this question. I said, and now, in other words, the Lord is not present here. Well, this is this is this, this is the way I feel about it. a very red face and yes. the silent withdrawal. Mm -hmm. So this this reasoning, of course, is primitive and nonsense. Yes, I think if uh, if the Lord didn't want us to go into outer space, He would simply deny us the means of doing it. And the fact that He seems to support our projects and allows us to demonstrate well, that we, we can. Do, uh, we do have the brains. 
our bodies are built better for high accelerations than the bodies of any other animals except our relatives, yes. the primates. So it looks very much, if the term can be used here in this connection, like something preordained. Precisely, precisely. But I wanted to bring this up because that question does come up every once in a while, uh, mostly from laymen, I mean now in the theological sense, because the theologians who have been thinking about this problem for about as long as we have been talking about the engineering problems are, of course, convinced that there is no obstacle from where they sit. Well, the Pope himself has blessed the idea of flight into outer space uh, during the uh, meeting of the International Astronautical Federation in Rome in uh, 1957, I believe, or was it 56? Uh, he, no, 57. 57, and he stated very plainly that uh, uh, God has in no way limited man to, to this planet, and that... Uh, the Catholic Church uh, saw no uh, objections whatsoever to this uh, endeavor of uh, yes, well, I, exploring other worlds. I read his statement both in the original French and the English translation. That's why I said the theologians, of course, who have been thinking about this will not voice this objection. It comes only from circles of laymen. I think it is a great tragedy that so many people still believe that uh, religion and science are uh, not compatible, and it's uh, a way, uh, in a way, a fundamental uh, uh, struggle on between what you might call uh, search for faith and search for truth. I think uh, with every new mystery that science has solved, it has op also discovered at least three new questions which science hasn't solved yet. Yeah, and I think the closer uh, we get the facts and the more we learn about the mysteries of uh, nature the more we learn to uh, uh, to uh, mm, uh, to adore and to just uh, uh, become uh, more humble in our outlook yes and this is bound to happen I, I have a quotation there from the French philosopher Pascal which I love and which I have used before on occasion uh, where Pascal said that knowledge can be compared to an expanding sphere. The larger it grows, the more points of it will touch the unknown. Yes. That is yes. <laughs> precisely the same you just said yes. before. Yes. As our knowledge expands, and this is to be, this time the word is to be taken literally, uh, one day we will run into other life forms. And this, of course, is the second most favorite question that always comes up after every lecture about other life elsewhere. Well, I think there's enough evidence today that at least some low forms of life exist on Mars. Yes, that can be accepted as... We know as that uh, whenever the snow melts on the northern or the southern polar cap of Mars and... Uh, humidity reaches the uh, moderate uh, latitudes that uh, uh, vegetation seems to spring into life and uh, large areas of Mars are covered by a bluish and greenish uh, hue. Uh, in fall, on that particular hemisphere of Mars, this vegetation seems to wither and these seasonal effects uh, appear uh, Every, during every March in year. They come up every year, and there is one other little item which is very interesting. You said that the vegetation is bluish green or greenish blue. Well, a Russian astronomer by the name of Tikhov has been looking around on Earth for equivalent color values in vegetation, and he found them strangely enough in the North Siberian forests. And then he made additional measurements which gave the result that a forest in the temperate zone will radiate or re reflect, not radiate, reflect about 25% of the infrared of the heat rays that hit mm -hmm. the leaves. Mm -hmm. The North Siberian forest cannot afford this. It does not reflect more than about 2% of the infrared rays. And the Martian plants have the same color value. They, of course, since Mars is farther from the sun, also cannot afford to waste any infra infrared that may strike them. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So we are pretty certain about life on Mars, at least vegetation. Uh, but when the public asks this question, they always have oh, something more than plant life in mind. They, and they are not even interested just in the neighboring planets. They mean, well, they say the universe, they mean the galaxy as a whole. Well, I have no doubt whatsoever that in the, in the vast depths of the universe, there will not be just a, a few hundred, but probably millions of planets capable of supporting even higher forms of life. And I wouldn't be a bit surprised if there are some planets among them that uh, are capable of supporting even a much higher form of life than this Earth. In other words, that there are intelligent beings around somewhere who, uh, uh, for, for whom we, uh, we, with all our intelligence, would be no match. Well, of course, this is the same way I feel about it. And I think the most interesting moment in history that could happen is if two such cultures meet. Yes, it certainly would. Whether we'll ever be able to visit such a planet remains to be seen, but uh, in uh, 25 years of work in the missile and space field, I've always found out that whenever I use the word impossible, I, I uh, ultimately wind up at the losing end. <laughs> you ultimately wind up building it. Yes, building it. <laughs>